Oh, actually, I should probably share this. I'm going to share a link. Um, my slides are a hack and D. Um, let me just stop sharing because I don't know if I can type in the chat. One sec. Okay. Um, Y'all can follow along uh, to the slides, or sorry, to this hack and D. It's um, it's kind of interactive. I have some interactive graphs. Has some links that might be useful. Um, so um, let's share my screen again. Okay. Can y'all see um, Element Deep Dive? All right. Okay. Yep. So. Um, Okay, so yeah, I'm Johnny Ray of Element Finance. Um, this talk is going to be centered around some of the more like foundational pieces of the protocol. I'm going to touch on like the analysis, some simulations, and like towards the end, like kind of some ideation we've done in order to kind of like give you all like a more intuitive feel. Maybe not just like how to use Element, but maybe how you can build on it. Um, but kind of to start out, um, figure maybe I should talk about like how Element works, just like kind of like a, a quick little intro there. Um, so what we do is we take like a yield bearing asset, like a urine vault, um, we wrap it and we create like two tokens, like a principal token and a yield token. And the principal token is like gonna be redeemable at the end of the fixed term for the original amount that's deposited. And the yield token is redeemable for whatever yield's been earned. Um, and so like the idea behind splitting the principal and the yield token is that it's supposed to like, you know, basically it's gonna open up some like interesting possibilities. So like principal tokens can be like sold at a discount to free up capital um, that can be used to like reinvest and increase exposure to like variable yield, basically just help like you be more like capital efficient with your investments. Um, and buyers of the principal tokens actually get a great deal because it's just a simple way to like lock in a fixed interest rate. Um, okay. so. Uh, that's that's basically like the TLDR of the of the protocol. But the, you know, kind of the next thing to learn about is really just like how do we actually like price these principal tokens? Um, and the way we do it is by actually like we build on the ideas um, that were presented and talked about in the yield space paper. If you guys haven't read that paper, I suggest checking it out. It's not like a prerequisite to using Element or like um you know or building on it even um but it's actually just a really good paper so um uh, i think i have a link to it in here somewhere um uh now when i was like preparing for this talk what i wanted to do was like i wanted to like dive into like the math of the element construction paper but i wasn't really sure that 30 minutes of like long division um was going to be that interesting or compelling uh to people so what i tried to do instead is like um i'm trying to like provide some like interactive visualizations that kind of like capture the essence of like some of the more academic like aspects of the construction paper. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So um, uh, basically like, um, you know, the first important thing to understand like, you know, on how principal tokens are priced is like, we use these, this constant power sum invariant. And this constant power sum invariant was defined in the yield space paper. And, and the, what it does is it includes a time parameter that allows its behavior to change as the principal token reaches the term's maturity. So like initially, like the what the invariant's gonna do is it's gonna like allow for like more price discovery, but as T, you know, near zero, near the maturity date, um, the invariant kind of forces that principal token and the underlying asset to converge in price. Um, so like here I have this, um, this cool little like Desmos plot, um, it's like a, a and basically, uh, I parameterized time here. And so you can see, like, so you can think in the beginning of, like, when the, you know, when a term first launches, like, T is going to be, like, one, okay? And you can see how uh, the constant power, um, you know, some formula, you know, is, is essentially, like, converging, behaving very similar to the constant product rule, um, you know, which is the invariant that, like, Uniswap, like, uses. So, um, what it does is it, it's going to allow for more price discovery early on in the term. Um, and I think if you're, if you're interested in a proof actually, cause like that, that it converges on the constant product. sum, I think the yield space paper actually like has a proof that is like T approaches one, you get this constant product function. So, um, so check that out if you're interested. Now, 
um, as t approaches zero, um, it's kind of trivial to see just looking at the, the equation, but as t approaches zero, you can see, um, you know, that it's going to actually just converge on x plus y equals k, which is the constant sum formula. So um, anyway, so like now in order to like actually use this formula to like, um, I guess to like price the tokens, what we can do is solve for like the output, you know, given some input amount. Um, you know, next there's fees and, and honestly, like what we do with fees is, is like dead simple. We literally just take like a percent of the yield. And, and like, just a quick note, like the fee calculation um, is a little bit different than what they talk about in the yield space. Um, both methods, both methods essentially like price fees in yield space. So the closer you get towards maturity, the less the fees are. However, our, we felt like this approach was like a little bit more straightforward, more gas efficient to implement in solidity. So that's why we kind of went this direction. Um, and if you want to like know more about um, how we use the, um, you know, this invariant, you can check out like Appendix A in the element construction paper. It's got some more details. Um, okay, so uh, you know, now that we're actually like, uh, you know, we know the basics about how the cur curve works, you know, like how we use it. Like the next thing to understand is like, how do we configure the curve parameters to meet our needs? So like when, when configuring like a pool, the price principal tokens, um, it's important to like consider the, the effect of the underlying vault APY, um, you know, like on the reserves required to price the principal token appropriately. So like the lower the APY, the larger the proportion of the underlying assets got to be in order to provide, um, in order, in, the, the, basically like the larger the proportion of the underlying assets must be provided to, to, you know, to the staking pool in order for that pool to like represent this APY. So um, it sounds bad, but fortunately we can actually mitigate this problem by introducing like a time stretch parameter. So. Um, the best way really to like understand what I mean by time stretch is like, just look at this formula here. Um, so, I mean, if say we have like a term that's like 12 months and we're saying we're using a two year time stretch. What I mean is that, that the time parameter is gonna be initialized at 0 0.5. If the time stretch parameter is four years, it's gonna start at 0.25. So, um, so that's, that's fairly simple. Okay. so. Um, you know, really like what we want to do, first of all, like when configuring this curve is we want to optimize the staking requirements for a particular APY. Um, you know, if you look at this plot here, you can see like the X axis is like the principal token APY and the Y axis is going to be the ratio, um, the ratio of the reserves um, to actually like represent this APY. You can see with like a time stretch of equal, you know, a time stretch of one, it's going to take like, four times as much of the base asset, so like ETH, um, uh, you're gonna have to do like a four to one ratio of ETH to like the principal token in order to actually participate in staking, which is like not very capital efficient. And, um, and so what we can do is, um, you know, is, uh, is actually like tweak this time stretch parameter. And you can see like, say we wanna like, if we, kind of like search for a time stretch, we want to look for one to where like the reserve ratio is going to be about one to one. So you can see like assuming like a 20% APY um, at a time stretch of around three years, um, we end up with like a one to one, um, you know, base asset, you know, uh, to principal token reserve ratio, which seems pretty reasonable and it's a lot more, you know, capital efficient. Um, Okay, so goal number two. Um, now, like, keep in mind, like, the APY um, of the underlying yield bearing asset is going to change over time. Uh, so it's going to be important to, like, select a time stretch that allows this invariant to, like, adapt um, accordingly. So we want to make sure that, like, we don't select a time stretch parameter that's, like, so big we can't properly price discover. Okay, so, um, you know, if you were obviously you recall from like the last plot, we determined that like a time stretch of three will allow stakers to provide a one to one ratio. Um, so what we can do here is like, now we have a plot, 
same, you know, X axis is like the principal token APY. This time the Y axis represents like the max percent change in APY. So let's play with the time stretch parameter and see if we move it to three, um, basically what does that do to our, you know, ability to price discover. And so it looks like at a time stretch of three, 20% um, APY, the max percent change in APY, like given these parameters is gonna be like a 200%. So it's gonna be able to price discover to like, you know, like a 60% APY. Um, and so, so that's, you know, in this case, like I would say this, this particular APY um, and what we consider like a desirable ratio of reserves, like we can see that like price discovery isn't really gonna be an issue, right? But the reason why we keep that in mind um, is that later on we might want to decide we might decide to like further relax the staking requirements so like the reserve ratio is even more favor of like stakers and capital efficiency so um given that scenario like depending on the apy in question we really just want to ensure that the price discovery is still part of the constraints and methodology used when configuring these concerns sorry these curves um so um you know with that in mind like you know we've you know, we can see how we can like modify this time stretch parameter to ensure that like staking requirements are reasonable. Um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and also ensure that the curve can still function well enough to enable proper price discovery. Really the, the next thing we wanna do is like, um, we just wanna like be able to synthesize this information into some sort of like reasonable like constraints that we can define in order to search for like feasible time stretches for like any APY. So like looking at this plot, um, basically like what we have is like a range of like feasible time stretches that satisfy like this following constraints, which is like, we're about close to one to one reserve ratio. And then price discovery in this case is like about 50, like plus or minus 50% of the APY. So like the way you would use this is like, say, um, I don't know, say like the APY of the principal tokens, like 10%. Um, so, so that's what we think it's going to trade at. So what we want to do is we want to configure this curve. Um, so we look up on the x-axis where 10% is, and then we kind of like walk up, you know, the y-axis and, and see kind of like where the red line starts. So it looks like somewhere between four and 11 year time stretch is going to um, um, essentially like meet these requirements. Um, now keep in mind, like this is this is kind of like a, like a discovery science sort of explanation um, of how we do this like curve configuration. So, but if you wanna like look at appendix B in the element construction paper, um, there's like more details and there I'll walk you through like some of the math, like on how we calculate like price discoverability, like what some of the assumptions we made are, like how you can solve for max feasible trade, basically like the max feasible trade. Um, so check that out if you wanna actually see the you, you know, the actual like, um, you know, arithmetic or whatever. Um, but the idea here is just basically kind of give you an idea of like what our methodology is for like actually configure these like at kind of more of an intuitive level. So, um, so next, like um, I want to talk about like market simulations and like the purpose of this section isn't like to show you guys on like how profitable staking is going to be an element. I mean, I, it's going to be profitable. And I think a lot of people are going to want to participate but this is more about like the mechanics of simulating the market. Um, and, and um, excuse me. <coughs> um, and, and basically like um, making sure like things behave as expected. <coughs> Sorry, let me get a drink of water. Mm. So like these, are simu these simulations essentially like assume that the purchasing activity is going to decline as the maturity period of the term like draws closer. So it's, it's going to simulate sort of like the kind of price um, or volume that you'd see like in a, in a real bond market. However, we don't really like know what the trade volume is going to look like. So, so this particular simulation kind of just like picks like a worst case scenario. And the way it works sort of is like as follows. Basically like we load up like the market price, um, you know, like the APY curve parameters, um, you know, of the asset. And then we calculate the reserves required to represent like a specific target liquidity that we're trying to like um, simulate the price action on. And, and then we calculate like a target volume for each day. And as I mentioned earlier, like, um, 
basically it's that's going to be a function of like the maturity ratio so so then for each day like in the term we're going to simulate the trades basically needed to meet that day's like target volume the way we do it is we basically like we'll randomly select like a target order size and like for simplicity it's just like a simulated sort of like quasi normally distribution, like a mean order size that like roughly matches what you'll see on like Uniswap. And like, we don't know like what these orders are gonna look like on mainnet, right? So, you know, we've we've tried a variety of distributions and order sizes and, and whatnot. And so really like the idea here was just to sort of like start developing the methodology um, so that we can kind of plug in real numbers once we get, um, once we get to like um, the mainnet. Um, so, you know, next then we'll like randomly select like an input and output token um, and then the direction of the trade. And these trades are going to kind of like continue until like the daily volume has been met, at which point we'll like increment the day and start over. So like rinse and repeat until the entire term has been simulated. Um, and so like this data is not like just used in like our analysis and to like validate like some of the you know, the, the curve parameter configuration is actually used to like test the smart contract to ensure that they behave as expected. Um, you know, and, and like, like we're happy, like the simulation is like nice and it's like a good start and everything, but there's so much more we can do like going forward. So like, for example, like we could like start adding in like simulation of like adding and removing liquidity. And this could be part of like a deeper and like more dynamic simulation of like the underlying yield bearing asset and like the effect that deposits and withdrawals are gonna have on yield. And this is like sort of like just the most obvious like first order interactions. And there's like much more interaction, there's like much more interesting interactions happening like within these yield bearing assets as a result of like, like broader trends in DeFi. And so like, for example, like say we're looking at like the curve stake ETH vault. So like what happens if the Lido rewards change? Like what happens to yield if there's like a hiccup in ETH2 staking? Um, like what's the effect of the validator activation queue on the stake ETH token? Like we know the max like activation rate, um, you know, at, you know, given a certain demand, like, so we should be able to simulate like this activation queue and then the resulting effect on that yield bearing asset. Um, and so um, another thing we can do is like sort of like close the loop between like the curve parameter, sorry, configuration, like price initialization, and these simulations. There's some like really, really fascinating market forces that we think will drive like the price action of the principal token and the yield tokens. Um, and actually, like I didn't mention this earlier, but like because users can deposit into an open term um, and essentially like pay for yield that's already been accrued, like this links the price of the yield token and the principal token. So it'll be really interesting to see like how different like trading strategies can take advantage of this coupling like in order to like, uh, like arb the prices and maximize yield. And I mean, really like the great thing about all this is it's like healthy for the, like the element protocol. So that's why we spend a lot of time like thinking about these interactions and like writing about them, encouraging people to like get involved and build, excuse me, and build on element. Um, and one of like the, um, oh, and by the way, like uh, section 4.3 of the element construction paper We'll talk a little bit more about the simulation if, if you're interested and you want to follow through to that. Um, so one of the um, so one of the like the the first things we thought of um, uh, the first strategies we thought of that you could build on the Element Protocol is what we call like um, it's kind of like a form of leveraging. It's called yield token compounding, and so what that is it's the process of like repeatedly selling the principal and then depositing it, redepositing it to gain further exposure to the yield. So yield token compounding is unique to Element, provides a way for, for you to like gain like a levered exposure to variable interest without really any additional risk. So, so this analysis, like honestly, could be like a talk all by itself. Um, so what I'm going to do is like make some simplifying assumption here, like, like the calculations of this example, they're not going to take account, you know, like gas fees or like slippage or trading fees, sort of just to maintain simplicity. Um, but but the formulas you see here are actually still pretty useful. So, um, so I, right off the bat, you know, like given like the number of times you want to compound and like your fixed rate and the principal, you can calculate right away like um, the number of principal tokens you'll be left with, the number of yield tokens you've you know accumulated, and this last formula basically is your resulting APY boost. Um, okay, so so taking a look at this action, this plot here. Um, 
really it's just designed to sort of like drive home like how profitable like yield coupon yield, yield coupon yield token compounding um can be so let's say you have like a year like a year involved it's making like um like a 20 percent apy you could deposit in that vault and be happy with your 20 percent apy right um or you could just you know decide to like play this yield token compounding game so um let's say that the principal tokens are selling at you know a 10 percent um discount um, and then the yield on the underlying vault is expected to be like an average of like a 20% APY um, for the term. So what this plot does is it shows that after like 10 compounds, you'll end up with like, um, you know, rather than instead of like a 20% APY, um, at, you'll end up with like a 70% APY. Um, and, and we have these little sliders here to demonstrate like um, one thing to keep in mind is in order for yield token compounding to be profitable, the fixed rate's got to be lower than the variable rate. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, so this is like a simple example, but really it's just designed to sort of like make us think about like, um, you like what market forces are like really at play here. So like the more you yield token compound, the more you flood the market with principal tokens, right? So like the more principal tokens you have, um, you know, the lower the price is going to be, the higher the APY. So like eventually that APY is going to get close to or higher than, you know, the expected yield of the underlying vault. And that sounds bad, right? Because now yield token compounding is not going to be profitable. Um, but it's actually not. It's actually cool because what's going to happen is people are going to like rush to buy these principal tokens that are like ridiculously discounted with like high APYs. So this in turn is going to like drive down the price, um, you know, so someone's going to be really happy playing these market gradients. So, um, you know, there's actually a really cool section in, <laughs> in the element construction paper that talks more about this, Appendix C and D actually. So, um, and Appendix D is going to like provide like a closed form equation that's going to answer one question that I think will be like interesting to people who are, who are you know, interested in building like a bot um, to kind of play this game. And like that question would be like, what is the max market APY that allows someone to hit a target APY after in compounding? So, you know, like assuming some sort of like speculated APY for a particular token input and, to and term link. So I think it'll be useful, you know, for those YTC bots and honestly, like stay tuned, like for updates and like articles that we're gonna have coming out. We're gonna have like a calculator that'll like help, you know, like in some like nice explainer posts to like help you dig into this. Um, and kind of like make the information a little bit more digestible. And then of course, like the, the construction paper really talks about this ad nauseum as well. So um, anyway, so this next, uh, this next section I'm, I'm calling just for fun, like the element state machine. Um, so really like I just included this diagram of the element state machine as sort of like a fun visualization to look at. Um, you know, so while you're thinking about things that can be built, on element, you can think of like, you know, like the diamonds here, are like decision points, right? So like, they'll be like the output of like a, um, some sort of like simulation or like a heuristic or some sort of like, you know, analytical, um, you know, model that you might be using. Um, and then the square is going to be like an interaction with the element smart contract. Um, so keeping that in mind, like what can be built on element, um, you know, just reading the list, you know, like, automated leveraging, self-paying loans, um, yield ladders. And actually like yield ladders like are interesting like because they could represent like a like an average like target like an average maturity, for example. And like targeting this average ma maturity could be like a powerful piece of collateral. Um, so like having a consistent maturity date could really eliminate some variance on yield. And kind of taking this further, you could you could even construct like a yield ladder to like actually like target a staple APY or perhaps like target like a, you know, a risk level across yield types. Um, and they're, they're super useful also just as like a, you know, an instrument for like investing. You just throw your money in some strategy, you know, that defines a yield ladder. And then it, um, you don't have to worry about like redeeming at the end of the term or whatnot. So, um, so, okay, so this is basically it. But like, I want to like mention a couple of things before, um, before I kind of like yield the questions. One, um, uh, you know, we're hiring. So if this stuff like um, interests you, uh, you know, hit us up. Um, also, like we're interested in working, um, you know, with people in the community, different protocols. Um, 
So, uh, you know, please reach out to us. Um, you know, like we're going to be releasing a lot of educational materials. Um, you know, we built, you know, element, you know, to be open, you know, to be built on. Um, so, you know, so please reach out. And then finally, what I wanted to say is like, I just wanted to like acknowledge and say thank you to like a few teams, like um, that element was like really inspired by. And like, so it, like the balancer team, first of all, like, um, we build like directly on Balancer V2, like we were a launch partner. Um, Balancer v V2 has like a ton of great features, um, but the fact that it allows us to define our own like pricing invariance or whatever is like really just, it's like, it's key to our protocol. Um, next is like the urine team, right? So, I mean, Element needs some sort of yield bearing asset like in order to like, work and like early on we considered um, honestly like rolling our own strategies and kind of like covering this ground ourselves um but we kind of like eventually came to our senses and realized it's just better to like build on projects like urine um so the strategy actually worked out great like um the urine team like really goes out of their way to like ensure deposits are safe um for their users um you know and ensure that they you know users withdraw more than they deposit they've been super helpful like with integrations um, and helping us integrate with your MP2 and looking, looking over at our contracts. So um, definitely appreciative of them. And then finally, like the yield space authors, um, just a shout out to them. Um, our principal token like uses the curve and like most of our analysis, um, you know, is based on extends ideas in their paper. Um, I, I really can't say enough about it. Like they're, they're just brilliant. So um, big thanks to them. And um, that is it. I'll leave it with a picture of uh, Greg. <laughs> that's a that's a solid ending to your talk. Thank you for that, Johnny. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Greg, if you have any comments about that, but <laughs> um, we have some questions from uh, from the audience here. Um, I may have answers. I don't know. <laughs> Thomas uh, asks, "What's the difference between this and Alchemix for self-paying loans?" Um, well, alchemists could use us. Um, so um, I guess that would be the difference, right? So alchemists, like, I guess, what do they use? Like a yield? They or sorry, they use like urine underneath the hood. They could use us. So um, okay. Um, and then uh, I guess the next question is, so the overarching goal is to maximize APY and allow users to leverage their yield returns? Um, I would say the, like, the goal is to um, basically create like access to like fixed yield returns. That's really it. Um, so, you know, yield token compounding is just like one thing you can like build on top of it. Um, basically, like, you know, what we do is like when you when you come to Element, you like deposit and you like can mint a principal token. So say you have like 100 ETH, right? And say you want to like mint, um, you want to, you know, deposit that into our protocol. You'll get 100, um, you get 100 principal tokens and 100 yield tokens. And that principal token is going to be redeemable at the end of the term for 100 ETH and the uh, 100 uh, yield tokens are going to be redeemable at the end of the term for whatever interest has been accrued. Um, but it's not locked actually, because you can actually sell the principal tokens right away at a discount. So the market's going to decide like what, um, you know, what that discount's going to be. So if I want to get 100 ETH exposure to like that variable interest, um, I can, you know, mint 100 principal tokens, 100 yield tokens, and then sell the principal tokens right away and say like the discounts, whatever percent, maybe I get 95 ETH back. Well, now I have like the 100 ETH exposure, um, you, know, you know, to the yield, but I also have my capital that's freed up too. So I guess maybe that's the point. Does that make sense? And then and just like, it's sort of a choose your own adventure, right? Like um, you saw my weird diagram or whatever, like you probably can't see it, but y'all can click on the link and play with it or whatever, but just do what you want with it. You know, that's, that's why we built it. We built it so y'all can play with it. So, um, cool. And then, um, Eric asks, I don't understand why fixed rate won't just tend to zero. Uh, in other words, the principal token price is equal to the base token price. 
Um, oh, I mean, it will like as it matures, it will, it, uh, you know, it will like. So I guess he's asking why it's worth less initially. That's because you lock up, um, you know, when you deposit and mint these tokens, like they're they're locked for like a term, like let's say like three months um, or six months. So um, because it's locked, there's going to be some discount if you want to sell it, right? So if you sell it and you sell it, um, you know, at a, a 5% discount or a 10% discount, well, whoever's buying that basically just locked in a guaranteed 10% fixed interest rate, right? And you freed up your capital, so. And then as time, and it, as, it, as it starts to mature and gets closer to, you know, maturity, the prices are going to converge, so. Um, in the end, they will be they will be one to one. So that's actually like a good question. I probably didn't explain that well. Cool. Thank you for that. And um, uh, I don't know if you just answered this question from Brendan, but if someone sells their um, PTs, wouldn't the buyer just immediately sell them one to one? Um, if someone, well, it, oh, okay, yeah, same, same. It's the same deal. So because it's locked up, right? Like there's going to be a, there's going to be a discount. Um, so. Cool. Um, and then uh, last question from Greg, um, if you use this across a layer two um, and a fraud proof on optimism gets triggered, wouldn't, wouldn't there be a double spend? I don't know. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> you guys tell me. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't started thinking about, um, you know, L2. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there's a lot of L2 experts on this call. Maybe they know the answer. Yeah. I don't know, Mark, if you want to answer that. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of implementation specific per L2, but I can talk a little bit about um, in the case of optimism in particular. So with optimism, as soon as there's a fraud proof, um, transactions themselves don't get reorganized. It's just the state routes get reorganized. You can, like optimism is two arrays basically of, of transaction and state route. So fraud proof uh, happens, reorgs all of the state routes uh, after including the uh, fraudulent state route. And then the correct state routes get filled in. So um, like uh, you'll only get double spent if you did not, uh, if you did a, a, if you did not wait the fraud proof window of one week, that's like really the only way to get double spent. Or you did a, a fast liquidity withdrawal without doing the like off chain validation yourself. Wicked. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Thanks for being on. I have a couple more questions. Can I jump in really quickly? Johnny, yeah. thanks for the presentation. That was great. Really interesting. Um, I feel like this this and pool together can work together in some way. I'm sure. Um, yeah, we should chat, dude. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I, I maybe I missed in the presentation, like, are all the PT tokens fungible? And if they have different maturity dates, like, how is that uh, reconciled? Like, if there if certain ones are locked up, others aren't, or are there actually different PT tokens for each? Kind of yeah, there's different ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, do we have time? I kind of want to follow up on my question earlier. I don't know if we have time though. Yeah, we do. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I asked about the, um, the, the, the fixed rate tending to zero and you're saying that, you know, initially before the, uh, I guess before it matures, then, you know, people are most likely going to sell it at a discount, but I mean, I, still don't understand why you would sell it at a discount. I mean, it makes sense for something like ETH where you actually have to use ETH to like make transactions and has like utility and stuff. But if it was something like, I don't know, if I was locking up, I mean, I, I don't think this would make sense for locking up like stable coins, but for something that's like a stable coin, for example, that doesn't have much utility except for like paying for something, like why, if I was like, you know, accepting payments, why should I not be able to just accept the principal token as payments and then just redeem it for that token later, effectively making oh, I mean, you could, the price you difference could. like zero? You can accept it as a payment. You could use it as collateral and it'd be really close. 
you know, you could use it as a form of collateral that's like pretty freaking close to like, a, you know, the value of the underlying asset. So um, you're, I, I don't know, like, and maybe I, like, maybe I don't totally understand the nature of your question. Like, um, if you're arguing that like the time value of money isn't real or something, I don't know, maybe, I mean, I, I like, I like, <laughs> I, I'm not a philosopher or whatever, but like, um, but like one practical reason, like why it would be worth less is the other thing is like, because um, we'll allow you to like mint into an open tranche, right? And so like, if you mint into an open tranche, is it fair that like you waited towards the end and, uh, or like you, you, you mint into an open tranche, you have to pay for the yield that's already accrued, right? So like, you're gonna receive a few less principal tokens um, as a result of any yield that's been accrued. So that like natural coupling between the yield that's been accrued and the principal token, there's gonna be a feedback there. So like it, that's gonna also cause a discount. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know if like my answer like satisfies you, but like we're gonna find out soon, we're gonna launch, so. Um, well, I mean, honestly, I was just kind of throwing some words around anyways. I mean, I'm still like on section two of that paper. <laughs> <laughs> Are we all just throwing words around? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely great conversation um, uh, coming out of this. Uh, Austin asked. But, it, but I was going to say, like, it's it's not like, uh, don't, don't take my answer as like being like a flippant response. It's actually like one of like the, it, it's one thing that we like sit and like, you know, talk about is these weird interactions between the tokens. Like, what are they going to work? You know, what's the market dynamics going to be like? We don't know. You know what I mean? Like, that's why it's like interesting. It's fascinating. So, um, you know, stay tuned.